we'll take one eight and a half by eleven sheet, cut down to six and a half. Cut this so you, you have a six inch piece. And you use entirely what's left, which is five inches. Now we're going to score this a little different space, so pay attention. The large piece we score as normal at three eighths and one half. Now this little piece, which is going to fold over the piece we just scored, we score at three eighths and five eighths. That gives us extra room for this to wrap over that piece and still give us our wiggle room on the inside. score lines, remember to fold over the ridges. Now this is fit just like this. So we have to put this this piece, the narrower piece down first. Okay, so it's six and a quarter, duh. I'll trim this off a quarter of an inch. How many of you caught that when I did this, huh? I bet quite a few of you. You're going, all right, you're doing it again. But at least this time I cut it too long and not too short. one open and glue this one right on top of it right here and remember to not go over the top of your score line or this won't fold close like you want it to You can see how that's close to the score line, 
but not over it. Okay. Now I thought we'd have some fun and do. Um, A magnet closure, but not one that we've been doing here all along. Um, I'm going to use this piece. I'm going to use some ribbon. And of course, we'll need magnets. Now, the first thing I need to do is figure out about how much ribbon I need. So it's going to have to go over, and it's going to have to go back. Well, that ought to do it. paper that's going over the top of it will come out here. So that'll be plenty. Now I want to tape that down. Why don't we find the center just to be different and maybe put it in the center instead of uh, just any old place. Get our paper down here, and I'm going to use this. to ink the edge. And I'm going to put some extra tape on and around this ribbon. I don't want it going anywhere. got to do two things here. We've got to get a magnet on here. And we've got to back this. As you'll see it's it's all sticky. And I'm going to use the stars. Stuck down to 
just yet. Um, Of course I did that. And I don't want it so far down.
eighth inch. I just don't. Not for sure how how stuck it would stay, quite honestly. So I'll drive, we'll trim this up a little bit. Six by four and three. Oh no, it's gonna be less than that. Six by four.
turns his head or in those blue eyes, which are very steely, they can be like a country sort, and he says, Tom, relax. All we're doing is making a movie. I did relax, and I got into a situation where I didn't have to know anything. I didn't have to cover up my ignorance. It was quite French Canal, and that was nice. It was good to discover something that I was trying to make. The greatest problem was that we couldn't see sink, because as you see, shot after shot, the ocean is very present and very, very loud. And so if we shot the right sound, the sound would have been completely obliterated by the noise of the jungle and the sea. Besides, it is impossible. There's only one shot in the film, which is when Kitty tells the story of Campbell, which we did in a secluded place, and which is the right sound. Nothing else is the right sound in the hell film. And we knew that we couldn't post sync because we could never get the kids for that. So what in fact the sound was done is that at the end of every day, we would go deep into the jungle where it was quiet, and we'd do the dialogue of the day. At the end of the shooting, I did four or five times the entire dialogue like a play. And then we came to Paris where we edited for over a year, and most of that time was spent syncing up the fragments of dialogue word by word. We contemplated blankets around the camera, blimps, everything possible. A big classic blimp wouldn't have worked at all for us. It'd just be clumsy and it'd take so much time to take it on and off to load and unload. We would try for obelisks, we worked for obelisks, we were trying to do the thing. Finally just went with it. Kitty was the most difficult job because he's such an extraordinary character and he's just everywhere for him. In America, in England, most of the year. And again, we took a crazy risk because we set our shooting day and we haven't got Piggy. We just had this dream that a Piggy would suddenly fall out of the sky, and he did. The Daily Telegraph in England published a little, just a little press note to say, British director wants to make a film of Lord of the Flies and can't find anyone to play Piggy, and it describes what Piggy was meant to be in Golden's book. And uh, a few days later, I received a letter a real schoolboy's letter on a torn page out of an exercise book, a sticky letter, but as good as British have written it was sticky, and in a sort of schoolboy's handwriting, this letter says, I think I am the piggy you're looking for. I enclose a photograph, and there was a photograph of this boy, and from a place called Camberley, he talks about in the film, and there was no question, this is all for a few weeks before we begin to do so. This is the last moment of any world. The real figure. Producer, who was Helen? We had to find English kids here in the States. We had Mike McDonald, who was Dwight McDonald's son, who was once doing the film, and we made him a casting director. That is, he went around to all the embassies, he went to various schools, he went to English clubs. He tracked down every English person in the States here looking for their kids, and of course they were just difficult to get them interested. But the ones we could find, we did screen tests. Interview them, and then we had a little eight millimeter camera, and Peter Brook would uh, talk to them and get them to read a little bit or talk about themselves. It was a long process, and even up until the last minute, the week before we started shooting, we went through Jamaica and we found those last four kids in Jamaica there. Sam Spiegel tried to get away with it by bringing in American kids and girls, and I gather I haven't seen the film that was made recently with American kids. But the strength of the original material is inseparable from the fact that uh, it's an English author who has conceived an extraordinary surrealist image, which is of, on one hand, a desert island, on the other, the most tightly brought up, rigidly conditioned English kid from the English public school with its old elaborate conditioning. And that is an essential part of the story.
This is um, a crocodile with deco and stub, and I use both of them. And this is going to make this look like a ticket. Page down. 